Many schools only cover a few important events and people from the Middle Ages, leaving out the numerous interesting traditions and societal practices of that era. This video seeks to reveal 15 of these medieval traditions, delving into the peculiarities that influenced life during that period. Each practice acts as a window, providing valuable insights into a world that was vastly different, yet surprisingly comparable to our own. Number 1. The Ducking Stool The ducking stool, often associated with the punishment of witches or unruly women, holds a more significant role in the history of medieval Europe. This apparatus served as not only a tool of humiliation, but also a means of social control, a public spectacle, and a cautionary ritual. It revealed the intricate attitudes towards justice, gender, and communal standards within medieval society. Despite its non-lethal intent, the psychological and social consequences of the ducking stool were severe. Primarily used to punish women accused of being scolds or nagging wives, it also targeted men and women involved in dishonest trading and petty crimes. The punishment's objective was both physical and symbolic, with the accused being repeatedly submerged into water while onlookers gathered to observe, ridicule, or even throw objects. This public display aimed to enforce social norms and represent the collective will of the community. Interestingly, the ducking stool was intertwined with a complex theology surrounding water. In Christian symbolism, water held dual meanings, symbolizing both purification through baptism and chaos and danger, exemplified in the biblical flood. The act of dunking an individual could be interpreted as an exorcism or a purification ritual, expelling the sin or disorder they brought into the community. Hence, the ducking stool held multiple layers of significance, incorporating social, political, and religious elements. It served to uphold community norms, reinforce authority, and provide a cathartic, albeit unsettling, form of public entertainment. While the ethical implications of such a device are highly debatable in modern times, comprehending its complexity offers a nuanced perspective on medieval concepts of justice, social cohesion, and gender roles. Number 2. Medieval Guilds and Secret Handshakes Medieval guilds were more than just early trade unions or professional associations. They played a nuanced and extensive role in medieval society. They were not solely motivated by economic benefits, but were deeply rooted in social and even spiritual aspects, influencing various areas such as craftsmanship, trade, politics, and education. In addition to their formal rules, guilds had secret rituals, such as unique handshakes and symbols, which reinforced their influence and exclusivity. Guilds were more than just professional organizations, they were brotherhoods. Members adhered to strict codes of conduct and craftsmanship that elevated their trade to a nearly sacred calling. Apprentices underwent rigorous training under the guidance of master craftsmen before they could become journeymen and eventually masters themselves. This process ensured a level of quality, but also fostered a system of mentorship that involved moral and social instruction as much as learning a trade. The interconnectedness of economic, political, and spiritual aspects within guilds has led some historians to compare them to secret societies. Although they were not necessarily covert organizations, their esoteric rituals and immense influence over various aspects of medieval life make them unique historical phenomena that are difficult to classify. Through their multifaceted roles, guilds influenced the medieval world beyond the production and trade of goods. They laid the foundation for what we now consider a professional class, establishing the basis for modern ideas of vocation and craftsmanship, while also serving as complex social entities with goals that exceeded mere economic gain. Number 3. Sumptuary Laws Sumptuary laws provide a unique glimpse into the social complexities of medieval society. These laws regulated personal behavior, including what people could wear, eat, or own based on their social status. The main goal was not only to maintain social hierarchy, but also to restrict excessive spending and extravagance. These laws were highly detailed, specifying fabric choices, embroidery limits, and even sword length based on income. Rather than being viewed as intrusive, they were widely accepted as necessary for upholding the rigid class system of medieval Europe. 
Enforcing sumptuary laws was taken seriously, with fines, public shaming, or imprisonment as potential consequences for violations. These laws were not set in stone and evolved in response to economic changes, emerging trends, and shifts in political power. During times of economic hardship, the laws became more strict to prevent societal unrest. While sumptuary laws may seem restrictive by modern standards, they offer insights into the values and concerns of medieval society. They reflect a society that prioritized social stability and perceived conspicuous displays of wealth or ambition by those outside the upper class as a potential threat to the established social order. Number 4. Wandering Minstrels Wandering minstrels, often depicted as carefree musicians who traveled the countryside, capturing the attention of all social classes, were actually much more than entertainers. They served as messengers of news, offered social commentary, and even engaged in political activism during their time. By bridging gaps between different classes, regions, and cultures, the songs of the wandering minstrels were not just about melodies, but also held the stories and history of society. They sang of significant battles, legendary heroes, as well as love, loss, and daily life. These songs were not merely entertainment, but a means of preserving communal histories and traditions, especially since not many were literate during that time. The minstrels themselves played a critical role in spreading these stories far and wide as they traveled, serving as one of the primary channels for disseminating information during that era. Wandering minstrels were an integral part of the social fabric of medieval Europe. They were not just entertainers, but individuals with multiple roles, narrators of communal stories, commentators on social matters, and facilitators of cultural exchange. Their significance demonstrates the intricate intersection of art, politics, and community in the medieval world, showcasing the era as a vibrant and interconnected tapestry of human experiences. Number 5. Alchemy in Everyday Life Alchemy, which is often seen as the precursor to modern chemistry, is commonly associated with mystical and mysterious practices. The image of individuals in robes working diligently to turn ordinary metals into gold or concoct a potion of eternal life comes to mind. However, what is not widely known is how deeply alchemy was ingrained in the daily life of people in the medieval period. Beyond its grand goals at its core, alchemy was a study of transformation, not only of substances but also of the human soul and the entire universe. Alchemists during that time were not only interested in spiritual matters, they also played practical roles as pharmacists, metallurgists, and sometimes even cooks. Their work had practical applications that affected various aspects of daily life. For instance, alchemists were primarily responsible for preparing medicinal remedies. They created salves, ointments, and potions that were used to treat a wide range of illnesses, indicating the indispensable role of alchemy in medieval health care. The herbs and minerals they collected were not solely for mystical rituals. They were also utilized for practical healing purposes. Although alchemy may seem mystical and misguided to us now, it was an incredibly practical and deeply integrated part of everyday life in medieval society. Alchemists were not isolated individuals who kept their work a secret. They were an indispensable part of the community, offering essential services and spiritual guidance. Their work encompassed a blend of science, art, and spirituality, enriching all aspects of medieval life and presenting a much more intricate picture than commonly believed stereotypes. Number 6. Heretic's Fork the Heretic's Fork demonstrates the extreme measures taken by medieval authorities to enforce conformity. This instrument of torture consisted of a two-pronged fork attached to a collar, preventing the victim from lowering their head or lying down comfortably. Primarily utilized by the Inquisition against alleged heretics, the fork symbolized the oppressive constraints on free thought and religious expression during that time. Beyond causing physical agony, the fork also served as a psychological weapon to weaken the victim's determination and elicit confessions. Frequently employed alongside other forms of torture and public humiliation, its purpose was to punish the individual and deter others with heretical ideas. Crucially, such devices were supported by both religious and civil authorities, 
illustrating the close intertwining of church and state in society. While the heretic's fork is a relic from the past, it serves as a stark reminder of the perils of suppressing free thought and the lengths to which authoritarian regimes will go in order to maintain control over ideology. The issues it encompasses, such as freedom of belief, the morality of torture, and the relationship between authority and individual conscience, remain as relevant today as they were in the medieval era. Number 7. Trial by Ordeal In medieval Europe, trial by ordeal was a judicial practice that would appear strange or even bizarre to modern standards. The idea behind this method was that divine intervention would determine the guilt or innocence of the accused. Essentially, it placed judgment in the hands of God, as believed by the medieval society. This method of trial took different forms, all involving the accused facing a physically risky or painful task. If they emerged unharmed or healed quickly, they were deemed innocent. Conversely, failure or injury indicated guilt. Among the well-known types of ordeals were the ordeal by fire and the ordeal by water. In the former, the accused had to carry a hot iron bar or pick up a stone from boiling water, and if their wounds healed within a specified time, usually three days, they were cleared. In the latter, the accused was thrown into water with bound hands and feet, and floating meant guilt while sinking meant innocence. Trial by ordeal was not just a medieval curiosity, it was a complex social institution that reflected the era's blend of faith, justice, and community. As legal systems evolved and the Enlightenment era advanced, trial by ordeal became outdated. Nevertheless, it provides an intriguing glimpse into the medieval worldview and the intricate beliefs regarding morality, divinity, and human agency. Number 8. Scold's Bridle The Scold's Bridle, also known as a Branks, is a disturbing relic from medieval Europe that reflects the complex views on freedom of speech, gender roles, and public punishment during that time. This muzzle made of iron was designed to be worn by women with a bridle bit inserted into their mouths to prevent them from speaking. It was primarily used to silence women deemed as scolds or nagging wives, but it was also employed to punish those accused of gossiping, blasphemy, and even witchcraft. This cruel device not only silenced the individuals, but also subjected them to public shame. They were paraded through town, sometimes led by their husbands or local authorities, in order to humiliate them in front of the community. The scold's bridle was not just a tool of physical restraint, but also a symbol of social control, particularly targeting women who dared to challenge the rigid gender norms of that era. This historical artifact serves as a warning from the past, a stark reminder of the methods used to silence and marginalize those who were viewed as disruptive to society. Although the device itself is now only found in museums and history books, the issues it raises about gender, power, and the boundaries of free speech remain highly relevant today. Number 9. Wife Selling The act of wife selling was a practice in medieval and early modern Europe that shed light on the intricate nature of marriages and gender roles during that era. Despite misconceptions, it was not an officially recognized method of divorce, but rather a public humiliation of the wife signaling the end of the marriage. Typically, the wife would be publicly auctioned off with a halter around her neck, with the highest bidder taking her. The significance of the auction was not the exchange of money, but rather the public severing of marital ties. Often, the auction was planned in advance by all parties involved, including the wife. In some cases, impoverished couples resorted to this desperate act as their only means of separation and starting anew. Although wife-selling may be viewed as a primitive or male-dominated tradition, it was a complex social practice that emerged due to the limitations of medieval divorce laws, which were often biased and inflexible, leaving few options for couples seeking separation. This practice reveals the restrictions faced by women in terms of personal freedom and economic independence, but it also demonstrates the creative, albeit problematic, ways that people attempted to navigate within an oppressive system. The phenomenon of wife-selling offers a disconcerting yet enlightening glimpse into the private lives and societal customs of our forebears. 
It underscores the intricacies of marital relationships, the constraints imposed by social and legal constructs, and the lengths to which individuals would go in search of happiness or freedom despite those limitations. Number 10. Jesters and Fools – Beyond Entertainment Jesters and fools were often seen as the comedic relief in medieval European courts. Their vibrant outfits, tinkling bells, and playful actions were seemingly meant solely for the entertainment of the noble class. However, their role went beyond being simple entertainers. They were unique individuals who maneuvered through a complex social landscape, offering not just amusement but also criticism and understanding, often disguised through satire and parody. One particularly fascinating aspect of the medieval jester was their ability to speak candidly to those in power, protected by their fool persona. Jesters had the freedom to say things that would be considered rebellious or even sacrilegious if said by others. They were allowed to mock, satirize, and question the decisions and actions of rulers, often serving as a voice for public opinion or a release valve for societal tensions. This frank critique, wrapped in humor, could provide rulers with perspectives they may not hear from their more cautious advisors. Thus, jesters and fools were more than mere entertainers. They were social commentators, critics, communicators, and even spiritual figures, navigating complex webs of power, privilege, and taboo. Disguised as fools, they held up a mirror to society, highlighting its contradictions and absurdities in a manner that made them essential to both rulers and the general population. Their role illustrates how humor and satire have been utilized as tools for social commentary and critique throughout history. Number 11. Feast of Fools the Feast of Fools, often regarded as frivolous or sacrilegious, was actually a multifaceted tradition that played a significant role in the medieval liturgical calendar. Taking place around the start of the year and climaxing on January 1st, this celebration allowed both clergy and laypeople to temporarily reverse the established social and religious hierarchies for a single day. During this feast, Lower-ranking clergy and even members of the community could assume the roles of bishops or priests while participating in various forms of jest, satire, and parody. It was not merely an ecclesiastical version of a masquerade ball, but rather a formalized method of socially critiquing and renewing the existing order. By overturning the usual hierarchies, it provided the opportunity to question and evaluate the prevailing social and religious structure. This role reversal functioned as a mirror, reflecting both the absurdities and the sanctities of everyday life and religious practices. Some scholars argue that this annual spectacle served as a release valve for societal tensions, allowing them to be eased in a controlled environment. Furthermore, the Feast of Fools had connections to previous pagan traditions and Roman festivals like Saturnalia, where roles were similarly reversed and norms were temporarily set aside. This suggests that pre-Christian cultural elements were incorporated and adapted within the framework of medieval Christian practice. Contrary to later criticisms during the Reformation that portrayed it as irreverent or blasphemous, the Feast of Fools was actually a sophisticated tradition that deeply engaged with issues of power, representation, and social unity. Number 12. Tithing and Frank Pledge Tithing and Frank Pledge were interconnected systems of medieval community self-regulation that are unfamiliar to most people today. While tithing is commonly known as giving one-tenth of one's income to the church, in medieval England it had a broader role. Without an established police force or complex legal systems, tithing served as a basic form of civil responsibility and communal security. Originally, a tithing consisted of ten households, with each adult male belonging to one. The main responsibility of this group was mutual accountability. If a member of the tithing committed a crime or was accused of one, it was the duty of the other members to ensure justice was served. Failure to do so could lead to collective fines or punishments. Tithing groups regularly had meetings to discuss community matters, settle disputes, and ensure everyone fulfilled their societal duties. As legal and governance systems became more advanced, these medieval institutions became obsolete. 
Nevertheless, they provide a fascinating insight into how ancient communities managed social cohesion and governance well before the modern state took on these roles. Number 13, Ordeals of Knighthood. In modern portrayals, the concept of knighthood is often portrayed with romanticized notions, emphasizing chivalry, bravery, and gallantry. However, the path to becoming a knight during medieval times in Europe was a challenging and demanding process, involving specific rituals, trials, and challenges that aimed to test and prepare aspiring warriors for their future responsibilities. Contrary to common belief, knighthood was not solely based on hereditary factors. Instead, it needed to be earned through a series of rigorous challenges that extended beyond combat skills. Typically, the journey commenced with a period of pagehood, where a young boy would serve a knight or a noble household, acquiring knowledge in combat techniques, horsemanship, and etiquette at court. Once the page reached the age of around 14, they would advance to become a squire, entering a more advanced phase of training. This stage involved accompanying knights in battles, tending to armor and weapons, and even acting as a personal aid during encampments. The final step in the process was the dubbing ceremony, where existing knights or lords would strike the squire on the shoulders with a sword, symbolically marking their entry into the esteemed Brotherhood of Knights. Following this, the accolade would take place, involving a series of oaths to uphold the virtuous principles of chivalry, which encompassed loyalty to one's lord and the protection of the vulnerable and innocent. The ordeals of knighthood functioned as a comprehensive training program, purposely designed not only to shape a skilled warrior, but also to cultivate an individual of integrity and virtue. These trials encompassed physical, psychological, and spiritual challenges, instilling the medieval values of honor, piety, and social responsibility deep within the identity of the knight. Number 14. Courtly Love and Troubadours Courtly love and troubadours played significant roles in the medieval social and cultural landscape, going beyond romanticized tales of knights and castles. Rather than being mere whimsical notions, these elements held nuanced positions, often questioning societal norms and presenting alternative perspectives on love, gender roles, and social hierarchy. The idea of courtly love originated from the imaginative minds of troubadours, poets who flourished primarily in the Occitan-speaking regions of what is presently southern France. Courtly love elevated romantic affection and unattainable longing to a state of spiritual enlightenment. Typically, these were tales of a noble knight's unwavering love for a lady, usually of higher social rank and often married. Rather than physical consummation, this love was intended to be platonic and spiritually uplifting, empowering the knight to become a better individual and a bolder warrior. Courtly love and troubadours fulfilled more intricate functions than serving as mere romantic fantasies. They provided a platform for negotiating and expressing new social ideals, subtly challenging established norms. Whether celebrated as an elevated form of affection or criticized as an impractical ideal, the traditions of courtly love and the troubadours offer a diverse tapestry for comprehending the intricacies of love, social status, and cultural exchange in medieval society. Number 15. Mystery Plays Mystery plays were not merely religious dramas created for medieval audiences to entertain or educate. They were elaborate social occasions that involved communities in collective storytelling, interpretation, and even theological discussion. These plays were performed outdoors in locations like market squares or on traveling wagons, often sponsored by guilds, religious organizations, or even city authorities. What distinguished mystery plays from other forms of religious expression was their highly participatory nature. Unlike a sermon or sacred text that delivered messages one way, mystery plays engaged the community as both spectators and performers. Everyday people took on the roles of biblical characters, injecting a sense of immediacy and personal investment into these timeless tales. This active involvement fostered a lively exchange of ideas, where intricate theological concepts were conveyed through accessible human drama. Mystery plays were not solely theatrical shows. They were multifaceted social and religious events that served various purposes, including education, entertainment, 
spiritual exploration, and societal critique. They functioned as a shared storytelling medium that allowed medieval society to investigate, negotiate, and occasionally question their collective beliefs and values.